to say, you have to say enough is enough. And then you have to have reciproc reciprocating action where you reciprocate with the action that follows enough is enough. That is a person who says enough is enough. That's a person who has gotten to a point where it, they don't want to deal with what they've been dealing with any longer. So now they're seeking another way, a better way. And they are determined that as they seek another way, as they seek a better way, that they're going to implement what they are receiving, what they are finding, what they are learning, because the one thing that causes all of us, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter your educational level, nor does it matter your income status. What, what is applicable to all of us, no matter your race, your creed, your color, your religion, whatever it is, ignorance will destroy and cause anyone to perish at any moment of any day. You don't have to be old, you don't have to be young, you don't have to be rich or poor. Ignorance has no respect of person. And God gave us the word on it. He says, my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. My people, not the devil's people, not the people that are worshiping uh, Satan and living in darkness and living how they choose to live. He says, no, the people that have been translated from darkness to light, the people that have been uh, washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus, the people who have confessed my son as their Lord and their Savior. He says, my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. And you say, well, how is that possible if I'm God's? And I'm being destroyed because of the lack of knowledge. Well, he answers. I'm glad you asked. Because he answers. He says, not that you don't have the knowledge. He says, it's because you have rejected the knowledge. You have not sought a better way, a different way. You have chosen to remain in the way that you have been, whether it's been what you know, what you have seen, what you have learned, or get, or get this, what life has chosen to reduce you to. There are some of us where life has written us a limitation of how far we can go, whether that be in our family life, our um, church life, our professional life, whatever it is, our financial life, Life has written you a I can go so far and no more ticket. And you know what? Many of us have come in agreement with that ticket. Many of us have said, you know, guess what? Maybe this is all I have. Maybe this is all I'm ever going to have. Maybe it'll never get any better. So I'm going to just take this ticket that life has written to me and stamped with you go no further and sit down on my willows and accept it. For those people, I've come to speak to you. For the ones who say, you know what? I'm already at the point of enough is enough. I'm already at that point where I know there's better. I know there is more. I know that God has a life for me that is not even comparable to where I am right now. I can't even compare it because I saw it in the word and I believe it because I read John 10, 10 and I understood when he gave me the distinction of what Jesus came to do and what the devil came to do. What the thief rather, I'll be more specific. What the thief came to do. I read John 10, 10 and I believe God when he says the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's the three things the thief comes to do. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that all three of those things 
will bring devastation to one's life, to one's family, to one's dreams and goals and visions, to one's um, aspirations, to one's uh, desires, even to one's will to live. And that is why we have to pursue and go after knowledge. We have to have a desire to learn a better way, to learn a different way. It doesn't mean that you are at a place of um, indifference, but it does mean that you have an opportunity to grow. And anytime you are of a teachable spirit, Anytime you are that person that says, you know what? My life has been stalemated for too long in this area. I have lived in this area two minutes, five years, 22 years, whatever it might be. And I'm tired of this way. If it's five minutes or 22 years, I want to tell you something can be done about it. Something can be done to change the course of your life and where you're going. But it takes a teachable spirit. It takes someone who's saying, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything about what I'm in right now. Oh, but I'm so willing to learn. I'm willing to get under somebody's tutelage. I'm willing to sit at Jesus' feet. I'm willing to hear and obey the voice of God, his word, his leaders, so that my life can line up. And if that's you, you've come to the right place tonight. If that's you and you really have a willing heart where you know, hey, I've been stuck in this mess. It's been going on for 10 minutes, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, or even beyond. And I thought for a moment that I had to accept life's ticket that it gave me, shoved it under my nose and said, here, you are done. You are finished. You can't go any further because I have stopped you in your tracks. And for those who decide that, hey, that's what you want, nobody will be able to take you out of it, not even God. If you have agreed with that, if you have made some type of covenant with that type of thinking, whether you've actually put words to it or whether you think it deep down inside, some of us would never probably admit that they've ever said anything remotely close to that. But if you're thinking it, it still shows on the outside because you don't make an effort, a concerted effort to find out what it is that you're missing because it's something that you don't know that the enemy knows about your situation. And he has now gained a foothold. Even his whole body has come into the situation and has set you down and given you that ticket and wrote you off. How many of you are saying, uh-uh, I refuse to be written off. I refuse to let anything or anyone write me off. When I know the other side of John 10.10, 10. the other side of John 10.10 10 is, but Jesus came that I might have life and that life more abundantly. Oh, yeah, that's the other part of it. Turn to John 10.10. 10. That was not on the list, but guess what? That's a good way to open up. John 10.10, 10. and Father, we thank you now for the blood of Jesus that covers this entire service and teaching. We right now release the blood in the atmosphere, the environment. We release the blood of the Lamb God over every uh, area of this earth realm, the heavens, the under the earth, and the seas. We pollute the waters of the marine kingdom with the blood of Jesus. We shut down the powers that wants to operate against truth. We bind the spirit of error, and we say, get up out of here by the power in the blood. We ask you, Holy Spirit, now to come and teach us that our lives will blossom and grow to higher heights and deeper depths. We plead the blood of Yeshua now over our lives and our families, our homes, our possessions, and our property. And we cover everything concerning us from our influence to our endeavors. 
as well as the work of our hands. We thank you now, God, for laying your hands upon us, for opening up our understanding, and for letting this word live big in us tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus. God, if there be any sin, if there be anything wicked, evil, or undone that would hinder us from receiving, from growing, learning, and being elevated, Father, we repent. We right now release the blood of the Lamb to wash us and separate us from all sin and all of our unrighteousness. And we receive forgiveness because we know that you promised us if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you now that we can come boldly into the throne of grace to find mercy and obtain, to find grace and obtain mercy in the time of need. Thank you, Father, for having mercy upon us, your people. In Jesus' matchless and mighty name we pray. Hallelujah and amen. We were going to John 10, verse 10. Because we're just distinguishing tonight which side you're on. You can be on the pitiful side that says, I'm going to take the ticket that life has written me and has shut me down. And I'm going to say, oh, well, I guess I have to endure this horrible situation. I guess I have to just stay here and just let the time go by because there's nothing I could do about this. It's gone too long. It's just too much. And I just don't want to deal with it. You can stay on that side, but that side for tonight, excuse the expression, will be the pitiful side. And then we have the other side that says, you know what? I may not have all the answers. And I might not be able to tell you what the problem really is. But I can tell you where I am. But I'm open to being taught tonight. So that I can apply the principles that will change my life. That will change my situation. And that will bring me to the place where I can live John 10, 10, part B. Let's turn to it. The verse says in 10, uh, chapter 10 of the book of John, the gospel of John, verse 10, it says, the thief, as I mentioned to you earlier, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come. That's Jesus. He's the I am. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So see, we have to choose. The pitiful side is the side where the thief has gained entrance, and now he's taken over. And all he's bringing is one of three things. He's stealing, he's killing, or he's destroying. And I'm telling us tonight, we don't have to be pitiful anymore. We don't have to stay on the pitiful side. We may have come in on that side, but I want you to know you still have a choice in the matter. God gave all of us, hear me well, God gave all of us in this place tonight a volition. I'll break it down, a will. He gave us, matter of fact, a choice, ability to choose. He gave us the ability to choose. So we can choose to be pitiful. We can choose to allow the thief to run amok on our lives and keep us in stealing killing and destruction because that's all he's bringing i don't care what we want to think about the enemy the thief the devil satan that one that one the dragon lucifer who was the angel lucifer now is satan the devil the deceiver the, the accuser of the brethren him belial beelzebub all of that all that's him if you want to remain there you have a volition you have a will. You have the ability to make a choice. But I'm sure somebody's saying, I didn't call in. I didn't come in. I'm not listening to this just to stay where I've been. Yes, I came in pitiful. Yes, I feel like I don't want to deal with it anymore. Yes, I felt like it was written off and I let it be just in my presence, but not in my inner self. I want you to know if it's in your presence, it's always in your inner self. Because it, 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 it comes out of you to be in your presence. So you can never get around it if it's pitiful. But then the second part of John 10.10, 10, it clearly states, I am. Not the words just I am, but the, the I am God. The one that spoke in Exodus. The one that says, I am that I am. When Moses was asking him, well, who should I tell 
them sent me. They're going to want to know who you are. Moses was told by God to tell Pharaoh, I am that. I am. So whatever it is you and I need him to be, God is saying, I'll be that. It doesn't matter what you need him to be because he doesn't have a problem, nor does he have any in, uh, um, uh, what is it? Inabilities where he cannot become what you want him to be. So when he says, I am come, that they might have life, and that life more abundantly, I want you to know tonight, here's the glorious part about it all. What's been pitiful can become a praising party. What's been hard can become easy. What's been debilitating you can now begin to make strides. You can now begin to leap over walls. You can now begin to turn things around and see that God has made a way. There's a door tonight that's been open for you. That's been open for me. Jesus says, I am that door. I am the door. I am the way for you to go through to get to another place. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. He says, I'm the door that you need to change your direction. You might be going down west, south, north, east, wherever. He said, but if you choose to change from east, I can help you go west. If you choose to change from south, I can help you go north. If you choose to go southeast or northwest, I can do it all. All I need is you to make a decision. All I need is for you to activate your volition, your will, your choice in the matter, because my people, he says, are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. But not because the knowledge isn't available. Oh, no. Knowledge is available. Remember when God said, let there be light, and the Bible records that there was light? Don't you believe for a minute that light was the sun or the moon or the stars? Oh, no. Go further down in Genesis, the first chapter, and you will see where the light, the stars, the moon, all that, you know, was made. But when he said, let there be light, that light was actually a word in the Hebrew that stands for knowledge. God wanted to bring knowledge because why? Knowledge is powerful. Knowledge lets you know that you're not a zero, that you are really a hero. Knowledge lets you know that your situation may seem bleak, but there is a way out, and Jesus is that way. Knowledge will help you to understand that, hey, being down is not a bad thing. Staying down is what's really bad. See, knowledge will help you to understand. I might look like I'm losing, but because I got the winner, the winner on my side, there is no way I can lose. Oh, I want you to understand tonight. That God is speaking because there is a door that he is presenting to all who have come to his house tonight. And all who will listen to this message later on when it's uploaded in the name of Jesus. So that lives can be transformed and that minds can be renewed and that homes can be saved and that families can be reunited and children can have a, a peace in the house where they reside, and parents can be on one accord, because why? There is an all-out assault on family. There is an all-out assault on homes. There are things that are known in the spirit realm as home destroyers. They choose homes, addresses, places where people reside, where it should be unity, where it should be oneness, where it should be togetherness. There is chaos. There's confusion, there's separation, there is division, there is calamity, there is almost to a point of killing and murdering. Why? Because the home destroyers have chosen at certain addresses, and some of those people are what God is saying about. They have a lack of knowledge and don't realize that their true enemy is not the flesh and blood that they can see and talk to. The true enemy is not the husband or the wife 
or the mother or the father or the sister or the brother or the son or the daughter or the nieces, the nephews, the aunts, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins. Those are not the true enemies. Now, you don't hear me say that I don't understand that there is such a thing called household wickedness. Or oh, I can go down the line and let you know I understand it. I can choose Joseph right away because Joseph's brother certainly was his enemy. I can understand that David, when he went to the field to help bring uh, food to the brothers because his dad sent him on a mission, how they ridiculed him. Or I understand that the, the enemies could be those right of your household. But I'm not speaking on those lines tonight. I'm speaking about the thing that God has put in operation. I'm speaking specifically about an institution. But more than anything, that institution that God put together, that's the first thing that he did before he made the children and the extended family members. Before that even came about, God did something that he uh, expected to make a difference in the lives of people. God called man and he said, it's not good that man should be alone. So that meant when God said it was not good, that meant that man was missing something. That meant that man was not complete in and of himself. And God saw that and knew that, and he knew the plans he had for humanity. So God decided that I'm going to set up and orchestrate this thing called family. And I'm going to start with the man first. Ladies, don't be intimidated. Don't even feel any kind of way slighted. Because if God started with the man first, and he had to put the man to sleep to take you out of him, you better know you're something special. So don't think that you have to rise up against the one that was there being put to sleep and having surgery done on him to bring you out of him. And when he saw you, he was all smiles and said, oh, yeah. That's not a dog, that's not a cat, that's not a moo, that's not a rat, that's not a horse. That is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Why? Because God had made the woo man in such a way that he understood that it was going to be something special. But see, while God was making it for something special, there's an enemy that was lurking about. There's an enemy that was on the, 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 the lookout, that was watching, that saw God make this man and begin to have communion with him and begin to give him the ability to name everything in the earth and begin to deal with him as though he was something special. And jealousy pricked his heart. Satan I'm talking about. Because, you know, he was already cast out of heaven. So he jealousy pricked his heart. And he wanted to just be angry and try to get back at God. So he had to plan a way to get into this, this family, into this relationship to cause havoc. And that's the same thing he's doing today. Somebody better hear me. That's the same thing he's doing today. There are spirits in the realm of the spirit that's looking, that's actually monitoring, that's actually scoping you out, scoping me out to see what it is that agitates us. What aggravates us? What causes us to get a little perturbed? Because guess what? That's what he wants to orchestrate. So he can pick your address and send it. Whether it's through the man, the woman, the children, the, the grandchildren, the cousins, the nieces, the nephews, the, the aunts, the aunts, the uncles, whomever it is. He wants to find somebody that he can utilize to start bringing havoc to your life because he wants you on that pitiful side how many how many of you already saying mm -mm, I, don't, I already got a change of heart i recognize that my address has been chosen i recognize that maybe yet i've been scoped out maybe my life has been being monitored by the adversary and by his cohort Maybe he is looking on to see what agitates me. And just maybe he has orchestrated a situation, circumstance, or maybe years of hell that is causing me to back up 
and sit on my laurels and say, you know what? I signed agreement that this situation is a waste of time. I want you to understand something. There is nothing. I want you to hear me say it again. There is nothing that is worth misery when you have a God that we serve in your possession, in your spirit, in your body, in your home, at your disposal. You can cry out. You can pray. You can scream. You can yell. You can call on him. You can begin to use the weapon he gave you. You can read his word. You can praise him. You can glorify him. I want you to know there is absolutely, positively nothing. Hear me when I say it. Nothing. That is worth you and I being miserable not one more day. If God is truly the God that you serve, why come to service? Why go to a church on a Sunday, a Saturday, or wherever you go? Why do that just to have misery at the forefront of your life? See, before you walked in here, before you dialed the number, before you streamed live, before you did whatever it is you did, you may have had that thought that may have been a process of thinking for you. But that's why you come to the house of the Lord, because he teaches us how to think. He teaches us what to think. He gives us his word so we can put it in our psyche, excuse me, and in our spirit and begin to deal with the lies that are fed us day in and day out. As I stood here praising the Lord, he sent me to Psalms 15. And I was reading it as I was standing praising the Lord and just thinking about the word of the Lord tonight and however he wanted to deliver it, it would be well with my soul. And when I got to Psalms 15, you can go ahead and make your way over there as well, because I'm about to get into what the real deal is, but this is all introduction. This is all letting you know that you can remain pitiful or you can be powerful. But you won't be both. You can be the one who says, you know what? Enough is enough. And something is about to change in my life. Everything that's not the way God says it should be, I'm going to find what the word says about it. And I'm going to put it in my mouth. I'm going to put it on my tongue. And I'm going to speak it to my situation until it conforms and changes the way it should be. But as I stood here and I looked at Psalms 15, my eyes really bucked because there's something I wrote previous to this that I had no knowledge of when I wrote what I was writing. I had no recollection of this Psalms 15 at the time. Familiar with Psalms 15, but it just never came up. But God in his ultimate wisdom and his glorious mind and, and his ability to download what we need, he brought me to Psalms 15. And I want to say this right here, right now, because it's going to help when I get into where we're going for tonight. I hope everybody's all right. Psalms 15, and look at verse number two. Well, I can go one and two. It says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Or who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And here are the answers to that. He that walketh uprightly. And work it righteousness. Now, this is the part I want you to hear. And speak it the truth in his heart. That's so powerful to me. And speak it the truth in his heart. The what made me go to that is because I began to talk about the fact that many of us are believing lies. I, I, I include it. I'm not uh, uh, disconnected from this. I am included in being and having been guilty of believing lies. And not last year, this year. Because you always have to be open to learning. You always have to be open to truth. There are many lies that are being served all the day long. Lies are coming out of the mouths of people. Lies are coming out of your mind from the enemy's suggestions and you think it's your own thoughts. Lies are coming from the television all day long, much, 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 an enormous amount of lies. Lies are coming out when you walk out the door, when you look at certain things. Lies are everywhere. 
But the same reason that lies are available is the same reason why truth is available. Because you have to make a decision. Which will you follow? Which will you believe? Which will you take into your bosom, into your heart, and make it your own? Because remember, God gave us what? A volition, a will, the ability to choose, which is in our soul. Our soul is made up for the new people and for those who may have forgotten. You are a spirit. What you see of me right now, for those who are streaming with me, or those who will view this video, what you're seeing right now, this is just my house. This is just my earth suit because I need to qualify to be here on the earth. So I have to have this suit. This is my house. This is my address. What you see, my head, my, my arms, my feet, my hands, my legs. All of this is made up as a body to, to house the real me. Oh, I've got to teach it tonight. So my, my real self, you cannot see. That's my spirit. And all of us in here are spirits because that is how we were created in the image and in the likeness of our God. Check out Genesis 1, 27, 28. He made us in his image and in his likeness. And if the, 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 the numbers of the verses are wrong, it's somewhere around in there. But the thing that makes us a, a three-part being is that we are spirits. We possess a soul. And I was about to tell you what the soul is made up of. The soul is made up of your, your, your will, which is what we talked about first, the volition, but it's also made up of your intellect or your mind, your, your, your thinking ability. But then it also has a different portion, which is your emotions, which are your feelings, what you can be able to feel with, happy, sad, depressed, encouraged, excited, weary, all of those are emotions. And, of course, I think that there's another part of the soul, which is the imagination. That's the part that is used for you to excel in life, for you to see visions and to, to, to dream and to, to go places you've never gone before. But your imagination can take you there. And it's not bad to have a good imagination. Oh, but if that imagination becomes evil, what a hellish situation it will be. So in the soul is where you have your mind, your intellect, your will, your volition, and your emotions, your feelings, and in your imagination. And if we do not have a strong base where that soul is being fed the proper truth, now we can actually have lies all the day long believe, being, being, being shot in our minds as suggestions. But the only thing is, we don't know that they are suggestions. Because the lies come from a place of, I feel like my life is this. I don't think this will ever work. There is no way I could ever get this done. It doesn't come from a perspective of someone telling it to you. Because if it came in third person, then you would already say, ah, wait, hold up. Where is that coming from? So the enemy orchestrates a battle in your mind to make you now doubt to make you now accept lies, and therefore you can't do what Psalms 15, verse 2, the latter portion, is saying. You cannot or choose not to speak truth in your heart because now your heart is being ministered to by the darkness, by the devil, by the wickedness, by the evil, by the lies, by the untruth. Why? Because he's looking to get in to your life to bring three things. Death, killing, and stealing. He's looking to bring destruction, to bring killing, and to bring stealing. So if he, if he, if he, if he wants to get you to a place where you are prime, a prime target, he has to mess with the thing that makes you make decisions, which is your thought process, your life of thinking. So if your thinking becomes stinking, if your thinking becomes out of order, if your thinking becomes contrary to the truth, now he has a foothold. And now he can go all the way in and bring devastation, bring death, bring destruction, bring divorce, bring argument, bring division, bring chaos, bring confusion, bring contention, bring strife, bring death, ultimately, because he has a 
good foothold where you and I have believed the lie. Well, I told you earlier that I was guilty as well of believing a lie. I was guilty as well and didn't even know that it was a lie I was believing. That's how crafty our enemy is. That's how subtle he is. That's how, um, you know, slick and sly he is because he's been doing it for a long time. He's been around before we even existed outside of God. So he already knows the things about some of the things that we know nothing of. And what he knows is if I can just get in his mind and I can just talk to her mind long enough, I can make her be pitiful rather than powerful. I can make him pitiful rather than powerful. I can make the whole family pitiful rather than powerful because I've gotten a foothold in the mind. And the mind is where the battle is. And when the battle is raging, nobody seeks God. Why? Because it's all a bunch of chaos and confusion. Oh, but I want to stand and tell somebody tonight. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus. My word says that God is not the author of confusion. Oh, that's the one thing you got to understand. The Bible says you got to speak truth in your heart. So you've got to tell your heart, heart, listen. You might be ready to go into that situation and contend with it. You may be ready to argue and fuss and fight and tear it down and bring it out and do this, that, and the other and pop your neck or, you know, punch the wall or whatever. You may be ready to do all of that. But the point of the matter is in doing any of that, you are leaning toward now being pitiful. And you're leaning for the thief that coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And when you come, when he comes to kill, to steal, and destroy, he's not coming just to do a little damage. He's coming to take us out. He's coming to shut it down. He's coming to turn it upside down. He's coming to make it look like a tsunami just hit your life. He's coming to make you so pitiful you'll never be able to pick up your head. He wants to come in and destroy your household. He wants to tear up your marriage. He wants to destroy your children. He wants to have them strung out on drugs and living in sin and living in a, a life that is contrary to the will of God. He wants your life not to line up with the will and purpose of God. He wants you to be a bad testimony about the truth of God's love and the truth of God's provision and the truth of God's power. Oh, he wants you to agree with his pitifulness. Yes, he does. That's why I opened up and said, it's time to make a decision. Do you want to be pitiful or do you want to be powerful? Do you want God's glory in your life? Do you want to be an expression of his glory? Do you want to be used to let somebody else know, girl, you can come through this. I've been through worse and look at where I am now. You can tell somebody, man, listen, God is real. And before I came into him, my life was a mess. But, bro, listen, I can certainly tell you, if you let God in, everything won't be perfect. Everything won't be totally uh, uh, removed from your life because God doesn't work like that. But he'll give you help. Somebody say help. He'll give you help. Somebody say help. I know you need it. God knows you need it. Now tell him that you need it. He just doesn't do it because you're his. That's why he says in his word, I'm talking about the Holy Ghost and took over and I'm letting him flow. He said in his word that if you ask, you shall receive. Don't you know he could just give it without us asking? Don't you know you don't have to seek and find? He said for those who seek, they will find. And those who knock, the door will be open. Why? God wants a relationship. God wants partnership. God doesn't want robots. God doesn't want to control and manipulate the people that, that truly want to serve him. He wants to know that you're with him because you want to be. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. He wants to know that you're with him because you want him, because he means something to you, because he's uh, he's loving and he's good to you and you desire him. He 
wants to know that your heart is in it. He doesn't want you wanting him because he can give you everything when you say, hey, come on, bring me this, bring me that. Come on, God, I'm over here. No, he doesn't want that. He will start off ministering that way to you and to me. He will begin to give us power. He will begin to give us a little something here and a something there. But as you continue to grow, he's not going to give it as quickly anymore. He's not going to give it as often anymore. Why? Because he wants to establish a relationship. And you know it and I know it. It's all a part of human nature. If you have somebody in your life that no matter how you treat them, you could always go and get something from them. You could always just go and take whatever they have. You could always get their lab. You could always get their bath. And you can just walk over them like a, 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 a carpet on the floor. Guess what? They have taught you how to treat them. Or they have taught you how you can treat them. And so they let you go with that activity. And when you come to God, you think you have the same kind of knucklehead. You think you have the same kind of food. But God says, not here. I love you too much to give you and keep giving you and keep giving you when there is no established relationship. So I will hold back. I will stop a little bit. Not because I don't want you to have it, but I'm more interested in your overall well-being that I will hold it back for a moment just so you can ask and receive, just so you can seek and find, just so you can knock and the door will be open. Because see, that's a, that's a progression. When you start asking from the beginning, he gives it right away sometimes, just bam, bam, bam. But then at the, as, a, as the time and the relationship begins to, to develop and it begins to go into another level, another realm, then he wants you to begin to seek him. Why? Because when you're seeking something, it's not easily found. So it, it calls for a little more of your, uh, your, your, your input, your, your, your ability to, to maneuver. It calls a little bit more for your concentration. So God says, yeah, start out asking, but asking may not, you may not get it when you ask. So now I want you to seek me. Now I want you to come and talk to me. Now I want you to pray inquiring prayers. Lord, why is this? And what's going on here? And what's happening in my life? And why am I going through this? And can you tell me about this? Don't think that you can't ask God those type of questions. Because if you don't ask him who's all knowing, who are you going to ask? Nobody else knows your business like God. Nobody else knows your bloodline like God. Nobody else knows where you really come from. I know what they told you. I know they said this is your mother, mother or this is your father. I know they told you that. But God sometimes will let somebody know the father who they told you was your father is not. The mother who has you in her arms right now is holding you, cuddling you, cuddling you. And, 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 and providing for you. But that's not really your mother. Why? Because God knows everything about us. So don't take it that because it's what you see or what you've been told that that's true. People of God, you got to go to the, the, the truth finder, the truth maker. You got to go to the one whose name is the truth, Jesus, the king, the master. And you got to begin to find out what was God's original intent for this thing called marriage, for this thing called family. We've got to go back. Because let me tell you, somebody got to stand up and fight for the family. Somebody's got to stand up and fight for their marriage. Somebody's got to stand up and say, not my house, not my address, not my marriage, not my children, not my home. No, you can't have me. No, you can't have him. You surely can't have her. No, you will not take and destroy and bring everything down to nothingness. Because I have a God that answers by fire. And although I may have been ignorant, lack of knowledge, that's all that means. Although I may have had a lack of knowledge in this area and I didn't know certain things, I am a student of the word of God. And I saw where God said in his word that if I him and I'll ask him I'm going to receive and that he will fight for me and he will help me and he will be my help. You got to know the Bible says that God is a very present help in trouble. He's present. Hear that? God is a very present help in trouble. That doesn't mean he was there yesterday 
today and now today you're on your own. It doesn't mean he will be there tomorrow and you gotta wait until tomorrow comes. No! Psalms 46, go there. Holy Ghost, work it out. Do everything you gotta do. Because I'm at the point now, people of God, where enough is enough. Pitiful is not a choice in the matter. Do I have any witnesses in the house? I choose not to be pitiful any longer. I choose to be powerful. Tell somebody, power must change hands in my life. Come on, tell somebody, power must change hands in my life. I can no longer allow the enemy to run amok in my house, in my marriage, in my mind, with my children, with my spouse, because I understand that God has a plan greater than what the enemy could ever do in my life. And maybe he's taking me hostage for 10 years, 5 years, 15, 20, 30 years. But guess what? If you still have breath, hallelujah, in your body, and the blood is flowing through your veins, and God gave you another day, he gave it to you to turn around and no longer be pitiful but powerful. No longer submit to the lies but speak truth in your heart. No longer say, oh, well, I guess this is it for me. I can't do anything more. It's gone too long. It's dead. It's stinking. Guess what? God specializes in dead things. Oh, yes, he does. He can bring life where death has been in charge. He did it for Jesus. Jesus, the son of God. Oh, yes, Holy Ghost speaking. Jesus, the son of God had to surrender to death on the cross. He had to give up the ghost. He laid down his life. He said nobody took it from him. But still yet, he died. Death brought him to the grave. Oh, but that's not the end of the story. And that's what I want you to know. Your situation may be dead. It may even stink it. But God doesn't end the story till he brings back the glory. Glory to God. God doesn't end the story there. Jesus got up on the third day. And he got up with all power in his hands. It's not enough for you to rejoice on a, a resurrection Sunday. For many of you it's Easter. But for me it could never be Easter. Because it's not about an egg. It's not about a bunny. And it's not about chocolate. It's about the one who got up out the grave with all power. Sometimes you 
got to say, God, this one ain't mine. This battle belongs to you. I give it over to you. I can't deal with it. I can't handle it. Because I know if I try to do it, it's going to be in the flesh. Because I'm at a pitiful state right now. And I've messed it up for too long. I've been in it five years. And nothing has changed. I've been in it 20 years. And nothing has changed. It's looking like 50. But nothing has changed. So God, I know I'm not capable of in and of myself. But I heard in the word. If I submit myself to you. And resist the devil. Hallelujah. He has to flee. What I want to do right now, Lord. Is submit. And let you. Take over my life and be in control and give me the strategy that I need so I can make my life better than it's ever been through your power, through your strength, through your spirit, through your knowledge, through your wisdom, through your word, through the blood, through the cross, through my covenant that I have with you. Oh, people of God, you got to understand. That being pitiful is easy. But being powerful takes some giving up. It's not anything to be afraid of. Jesus paid it all. Jesus gave up everything for you and for I, for me. So that I and you and me will not be pitiful any longer. So we went to Psalms 46. Because I got a revelation in my spirit as I begin to talk about God being a refuge. And being a, 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 a being a presence. Look what it says in verse one of Psalms forty six. It says, "God is our refuge and strength." You're weak, you're weary, you're worn, you're tired, angry, bitter, resentful, disgusted, aggravated, agitated, discouraged, depressed, suppressed, oppressed. If you're any of that, God will be your strength. He says, a very present help. Woo! Somebody say help. A very present help in trouble. See, if you really want help, you got to ask. If you really want change, you got to ask. God's ears in Psalms 34, it says God's ears are open to our cry. It starts off with his eyes are on the righteous and his ears are open to our cry. Don't you know when a baby cries, everybody hears him or her? Don't you know when a baby cries, the parents know that something isn't right? And a good parent will pay attention. Any good parent will inquire as to what's going on. Anybody know God to be any other kind of parent but good? Anybody know of him to be of any other thing but good? So therefore, what we have to do is humble ourselves. See, pride will cost you and me to lose it all. Because pride says, and I'm going to speak the best English I have, which is not so good right now because I don't want to speak it. Pride says, I ain't got time for this. I'm not doing this no more. This here goes. I'm tired. Enough. I'm not, and, not, and it's not the enough is enough from that perspective. It's the ending. It's the divorcing. It's the separating. It's the, it's, it's the, it's the, it's, wait, wait, wait. Let me do this. God gave me a revelation this morning. That's why this message is coming from a place that's real, that's in my spirit. Because I said something out of my mouth. And then the Lord backed it up with something later on. And what he said to me was, what people allow the enemy to do, hear this, whether it's through your dream life, whether it's through your everyday activity, he allows, and this is for the marriage union, the, 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 the institution that God has put together, he allows, people allow the enemy to separate them and have the husband and the wife on different sides of the spectrum. If you can see my hand, I'm pulling my hand from one another. And as I pull them away from one another, it becomes where my right hand is far to the right and my left hand is far to the
to the left, never ever meeting in the middle, because why? They're going in opposite directions, doing their own thing, never ever coming to the center to let God put it together, because why? Everybody thinks their way is the right way. And he says what man and what the, the enemy does to man, what witchcraft does to man, whether that's your personal witchcraft or witchcraft outside of you. We can have personal witchcraft by our rebellion. We can have witchcraft coming against us by the wicked spirits that operate in the kingdom of darkness. But either way, what they plan to do is they plan to put you and your spouse on opposite spectrums of the of the, of the scenario. So that means instead of you and this person who's supposed to be in agreement, who's supposed to show unity, who's supposed to be in oneness, you and the husband or you and the wife, you all are now on separate ends of the spectrum and now everybody's doing their own thing. So when the husband and wife is divided, now you have a huge gulf. You have a huge opening. And who sits in the middle? Surely not God. Who sits in the middle? The one that is the thief that coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now, if you've been married for five years, 10 years, 15, 20, 12, 2, 100, however many years you've been married, and if you have allowed yourself to be put on different sides of the spectrum, don't you know for those number of years that the enemy has been sitting in the center of your marriage, of your family, of your home, and he's been wreaking havoc but guess what? He's not there anymore. You are on automatic pilot because he already has sown so much dis, uh, discord and so much uh, 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 disagreement and, 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 and division and strife. He doesn't even need to pass by anymore because you're now you're doing it for your, by yourself because he has put so much of a gap. But God wants to close the gap tonight, but he has to start in the heart. That's why Psalms 15 says you got to speak truth in your heart. And what is the truth? Turn with me to the scripture that says, let me go here, because you got to see the truth. You got to see what God says about marriage. You got to see what God says, because when you see what he says about marriage, then you're going to see why he has family. And then when why he has family, it's because he has a, a, a purpose and he has a plan that he wants to bring the blessing of God to the household so that you can go out and bless others. I want you to turn with me to um, Hebrews chapter 13. God is a very present help in trouble. That's what for, Psalms 46 says, verse 1. Remember that. Hebrews chapter 13. We've got to close in just a little bit. Hebrews 13. And I want you to look at verse 4. This is the truth. And this is what you have to speak. And don't say because, well, I'm not married, so this doesn't apply to me. Or oh, it applies to everybody in here. Whether you married or somebody you know married. Whether you were married or want to get married. Whether you have situations in your life that makes it where you have, um, I'll leave it at that. Everybody has a place in this message because you have family. Hebrews 13, let, let's look at verse 4. Look what it says in the word. This is truth. Speak truth in your heart. Verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable. I'm going to read it slowly because I want you to hear what God is saying. His word is saying. Marriage is honorable in all. In all, marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. That's not my word. I didn't write it. I didn't pin it. That's not my name on the book. I'm reading out the word. You got yours at your house. I have mine here. And it shows you what God just said about marriage. And it also shows what he said about whoremongers and adulterers. God has a plan in his kingdom for marriages. And he says marriage is honorable in all. So now let me work on this part and we're going to dismiss. If marriage is honorable by God's definition, by God's standards, by God's word, and in your heart, 
and in my heart, we are cursing our marriage, hating the day we ever got married, sorrowful we ever walked down the aisle, pitiful because it didn't work out, sad because it's something that we thought would be this, but it's that. Now we are walking around thinking of it as a hardship, thinking of it as a, 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 a dissatisfaction, thinking of it as something horrible, thinking of it as something you never want to do. You'd rather live with somebody before marrying them because marriage could be very horrible when you look on. Marriage can be so horrible, you can make a vow as a young girl, I'll never get married. As a young man, marriage not for me, man. I'm a, I'm, I, I, listen, I'll shack up, I'll live with them, I'll test drive, but guess what? This thing that, see, marriage, it's not working anyway. Because 50% of the marriages, even in the church, are, 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 are ending in divorce. So why get married? It makes no sense. We don't need to get married. Oh, yeah, I'm talking like those who talk and the way they talk because why? This is what's taking over our world today. People have now changed the idea of the marriage institution. God is the one who created it. God is the one who said it should be. God is the one who put it into place. But God says, I've got an answer to those who want to turn it around and make it what it's never been. I've got an answer to those who say, well, I'll get married. But I tell you one thing, if it's not working out, I'm certainly going to divorce. I had a friend of mine. We all were in school together. And I remember her saying, I'm going to marry him, but I'm certainly not opposed to divorcing him if it doesn't work out. And certainly, sure enough, as I stand here today, they are divorced. Why? Because when she went in it, divorce was an option. I'm not telling you that people are still married because they never had a thought about divorce, that they never talked about it, that they never desired it, that they never thought that that was the best thing since sliced bread. I'm telling you that people who are still married are saying, God, and when God hears the cry, he helps. And then they can start seeing the benefit of giving their flesh over to God and not throwing in the towel and not saying, no, I can't do this. I want to be pitiful. I don't want this person. This person is, makes me this and makes me that. And I know some people have gotten divorced. And this is not to make you uh, feel bad. I'm not going to re, uh, to compromise the word of God to try to help people feel good. I'm going to tell you that God forgives all sin except blasphemy. So that is certainly something I'm going to say. But I'm not one to make you feel bad because I considered it many times. But God. And that's why I can stand here and let you know that divorce may look like an option. Divorce may feel like it's the best thing. The divorce may even be the, the, the glamour that, that, that television portrays. But I'm sticking on God's side 100%. I don't have a compromise for this or for that or for the other. Not when it comes to God. And God says marriage is honorable in all. So that means what we have to do, and it's a we thing here, what we have to do is now pick our hearts apart and begin to take out every lie that has been sown in the heart about the marriage bed, about marriage as a whole, about the ills of it, the, 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 the horrible feeling and the horrible experience of it. Why? Because all it takes is for somebody to die to their flesh. All it takes it's for somebody to want God's will more than they want immediate gratification. Listen to me. Suffering is a part of marriage. I don't care how long you've been married. I don't care how old you may be. I'm going to tell you the truth. Yes, get married. Yes, marriage is a blessing. Yes, God will keep it together. But I will not tell you that there will not be suffering. I will never tell you that there will not be times when you thought you made a mistake. I will never serve up an untruth and make you think that you can get into this thing and just coast on by. No, you're going to have to read your word. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to call out to God. You're going to have to study. You're going to have to apply what he says. You're going to have to deny the flesh. You're going to have to say, no, Lord, not my will. Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane. It was time for him to go to the cross. Jesus did not want to go to that cross. It felt bad. It felt like it was going to 
going to really hurt. It felt like it was going to be too much for him to handle. And he went to God three times. And he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. But the Bible says that as Jesus began to pray, he was sweating great drops of blood because he was in agony. He was in a place where he wanted to back out of the deal. He didn't want to stay with us being his bride any longer. He wanted to cut that marriage short. He didn't want to give up his life. He didn't want to be beaten and spit upon and brought to the cross and whipped like he was whipped. But Jesus said it the third time, nevertheless, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Somebody got to say nevertheless, not my will, God, but help my marriage. Help my family. I don't want to give up. I don't want to throw in the towel. I don't want to go the other way. I know it's hard. I know it's hurting. I know it's been rough. But God, I trust you. God, I believe you. God, I know you can do it. And when you do that, God comes and he begins to peel away the layers of mess the layers of lies, trickery, and deceit. And then you begin to see, wait a minute. God says marriage is honorable and all. And the bad is undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, he will judge. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to go backward. I don't want to hit bus hell wide open. I don't want to do your will. I don't want to walk out on my family. I don't want to break up my marriage. I don't want to destroy the lives of my children. I don't want my home in disarray. I don't want to have to have visitation for the weekends or the holidays or the weekdays. I don't want to have all of that chaos and confusion. But sometimes we go there because somebody didn't tell us the truth or the truth was told and we rejected knowledge. God has an answer for every ill in your marriage. I'm telling you, I will be the first to tell you, divorce can look like an option when your heart becomes hardened. Hear me. When the heart no longer wants to say what Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Do you know what that means? That means, God, my heart may not know how to love this individual anymore. My heart may have shut out even an iota of love for this individual. Matter of fact, my heart feels like if it could just move on without her, without him, I will be all right. But God, my heart is not speaking truth. My heart has hardened to your word. My heart does not want to submit to what you say. And if I could just die to myself, if I could just say, not my will, but thy will be done, God says he will come in and make everything new that we trust him to make new. People of God, the heart is deceitful, and above all, it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? God just saw, showed us in Psalms 15 that we must speak truth in our hearts. And I'm telling you, the family is in a crisis right here. Family as a whole, across the board. There are homes right now where there's probably a woman being battered, a man being battered, children being sexually abused. Uh, divorce papers are right now being signed. Some man walking out, going to be with the neighbor down the street, round the corner, or even next door. They are all, uh, and I don't want to be, you know, just on the side of women do it too. But there, there, there is an answer, and I want to point you to that direction. God is the answer to every ill that the family is facing, and I'm telling you, somebody has to stand up and say, "Not my house." not my family. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. If we can't get it together in one night, 
We're going to make it till God makes us at a point where we can get to that next level of seeing the daylight. But we, gonna not, we will not let this night turn into our last effort. We are going to allow the word of God to live in us. Why? Because the Bible says his word is quick. It's alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide asunder the spirit and soul, the joints and the marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word can discern your thoughts and your intents in your heart, in my heart. So if your intention was never ever to be true in the marriage anyway, if your intention was always to have an out if you just got tired, if your intention was to make it last, but now it's gotten a little bit old, the word can work on that. Try 1 Peter 3, women of God, men of God. Try Ephesians 5, 25 on down. Why are you in that too? Family. Try Colossians chapter 1, 2, or 3. What are those chapters about the family? Try that. Try Ephesians 6, children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that your days may be long upon the earth. Family, we got to come back together. We're allowing more chaos and confusion to hit our homes, to destroy our marriages, to take our children hostage, because you know broken homes lead to a crazy society. And a crazy society leads to much devastation because the church is going to be held responsible, not society. But if the homes are broken, the churches are broken. The churches are where we need to go and get back together. But everybody is not wanting to be uh, to stand on the truth of God's word. Everybody is so afraid to say divorce is sin or divorce is wrong because they want the type. I promise you, that's not my ill. God says divorce is wrong. I said I wanted it. God said divorce is not his will. I said I wanted it. God said divorce is not the way. I said I wanted it. So I'm not talking from a perspective that I didn't agree. I'm telling you I'm not going to tell you something to make you feel better when I know it's not God's intent. The Bible said God hates divorce. And you can still be living in the same house under the same roof and you are as divorced as anyone else. You are as divorced as the person who has never seen his or her spouse for 20, 30 years. They went their separate ways and they never contacted each other again. Many of us are just living under a roof and the enemy has taken over. Because why? We are just milit milit um, middling around on that pitiful side. I want you to know as I close, you and I have a decision to make tonight. Do you want to be pitiful or do you want to be powerful? Do you want to have the institution of marriage that, God plan, that God's plan is? Or do you want to let the devil come in and take what belongs to you? How many of you say, I don't want it anymore? It doesn't matter. It doesn't belong to me anyhow. But God says it does. God, matter of fact, God says this. Even if you divorce her, even if you put her away, even if you, even if the woman leaves, he says, stay, stay unmarried. Because if you marry somebody else, you're, you're committing adultery. I'm telling you what the word says. Oh, she just said that wrong. I did not. It's in the word that if you divorce your wife and she marries another, you causes her, you cause her to commit adultery. And the woman, if you leave your husband and you remarry, you commit adultery. I'm only saying what the word says. And I'm just as responsible for it as you and I are. But my question as I close, do you want to be powerful? Or do you want to be pitiful? Do you want to be judged by God for being an adulterer? Or being a whoremonger? Or do you want to ask God to help you in the mess? that you're in so that you can tell somebody, I was where you are now. I wanted a divorce, but God came and turned it all around and made my marriage the most beautiful thing ever. 
that I never thought was possible. That's my testimony. Whether the devil likes it or not. And when I teach like this, the enemy cooks up stuff to make me eat my words. But I decree and declare by the authority in the blood of Jesus and by the fire of the Holy Ghost and by the word of God, I will not eat these words. My testimony will not be eaten up. I bind the powers that are right now trying to work it out to make it so, but I shut you down by the authority in the blood of Jesus, and I release the word of the Lord to scare your conspiracy, and I say, Lord, let your angels be released now to fight on our behalf, because God has made it good. Mm, mm, good. Yes, he has. Does it mean it's free of trouble? No way. Does it mean it's free of challenges? No way. But does it mean that we've made a decision that it's us against the world? It's us against the devil? It's us against every kingdom other than the kingdom of God? It's us against every assignment of hell? And we're going to stand together? When you make that decision, guess what? It doesn't mean it's going to be easier. It just means you've taken divorce off the table as an option. And it just means that you choose not to live in your house like you're divorced, even though you're still married on paper. You're choosing to have a blissful marriage. You are choosing to have a blissful life. And I use marriage, but whatever your situation is, don't let it just sit there and just, just pine away. Choose to make it powerful and not pitiful, whether it's your career, whether it's your finances, your health, your mind, your body, whether it's your children, your grandchildren, your aspirations, your visions, your dreams, whatever it may be. Say, I do not want to operate in the realm of pitiful any longer. I'm choosing to go to powerful. And in every area you can be. I speak to you all as the Lord speaks to me. And I'm going to say this proclamation in the name of Jesus as it just come to me. When Lazarus died, the brother of Mary and Martha, Jesus went after four days of Lazarus being in the tomb. But Jesus got to that tomb and he told them, he said, roll away the stone. And when they rolled away the stone, somebody said, but master, he stink it. He's been in there four days. But Jesus didn't let death scare him. And Jesus will not let the death of your situation scare him. He will not let the death of your marriage, your ministry, your mind, your money, your career, your health, your aspirations, your dreams, your whatever, so on and so forth. He will not allow death to make him afraid. And I make this proclamation as I use Lazarus for whatever it is in your life. I say like Jesus said. In the name and through the power that's in the blood. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. What does that mean? Put whatever in the blank that Lazarus fits. And I want you to open up your mouth and begin to walk around your house. Begin to walk around your job. Begin to walk around every area of your life. And begin to speak to every dead thing. Everything that's ready to die. Begin to speak to it. And command it to live. Command it to come forth. And then plug it. Into the resurrection power. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. Plug it. Into the resurrection power. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. You lift up your right hand. And you say I plug my marriage. Into. The resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you still have breath in your body, I don't care your age. I don't care where you come from. Don't care where you've been and don't care where you think you're going. Your marriage, your career, your destiny, your calling, your ministry, your mind, your money, your mouth, whatever it might be, your health can live again. That's what I rose to tell somebody today. Make a decision. I will not be pitiful. Not one more day. I'm choosing to be powerful. 
And I got to tell my flesh, shut up and sit down and let God teach me how to take my life from glory to glory and faith to faith. Because it's possible in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you tonight for meeting us right where we are. We thank you for letting us know that you are very present help in trouble. And we thank you, God, that we shall speak truth in our hearts. There are so many scriptures in this word that will let us know that you are for marriage and that you are well able to keep it standing and living and glowing and blossoming as is anything else that these people of God may have concern about tonight. Father, I plead the blood of Yeshua over every household, every family, every person that is listening. I cover your life in the blood. And I decree and declare that your marriage, your ministry, your career, your profession, your investment, your, your health, it will not die. But it shall live. And it shall declare the glory of the Lord. And God will arise and fight for you. God, I thank you tonight that we believe and therefore we speak. We also believe and therefore speak. And we believe that you are able to do all things but fail. Lord, do miracles. Do exploits in the lives of every man, woman, boy, and girl that dare to believe that whatever their Lazarus is tonight, it can live but especially marriages and families. God, let a bulldozing anointing go into every home and knock those home destroyers down and never let them rise again. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for resurrection life being released into every person's life tonight, home and family, in Jesus' matchless and mighty name. Hallelujah and amen to the Lamb of God that was slain for us for this moment and this time. We thank you, Father, and we say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name, I bind backlash, retaliation, and revenge of the enemy, and we stand in our place in the blood of Yeshua. And in the name of Jesus, and we command every enemy to bow to that name tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hallelujah and amen. Glory to God. Be blessed, people of God. I know it's time well spent. But guess what? Many of us not going to bed. We're just going to go ahead and do something different. So I'm not going to hold you much longer. But I do want to say before you can ever, ever, ever ask, seek, or, or knock, or do anything as it relates to what we talked about tonight, you got to line your life up by accepting Jesus as Savior and Lord. Please pray the prayer, the sinner's prayer, and that's the prayer that comes from your heart. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe in your heart that he's been raised from the dead, the Bible says you shall be saved. I want you to know that salvation is just a breath away. Speak the word. Invite God in. Invite Jesus in. Tell him you believe that he died for you. Ask him to live in your heart. I'm just giving you some pointers because praying, praying with you, sometimes it just doesn't do it. You need to make that personal uh, relationship for real with him. And I want you to do that tonight. And for those who fellowship with us, if you would like to keep uh, uh, help us in keeping this ministry going forward, and you want to sow into this ministry, please send your gifts to post office box 879 St. Augustine, Florida, 32085-879, St. Augustine, Florida, 32085. We pray that God will return it back into your life 100-fold, and we thank God because this is the time. These next four months will be the most miraculous times in the life of all the sons of God, those that dare to rise up and be counted as the one who is manifesting in the realm of the spirit as the true sons of God. We love you all here at Bread of Life International Ministry. Be blessed, be encouraged. I'm excited about your future. And I know 
that God has turned things around. You will not leave pitiful. You will leave here powerful. God bless you all. Have a great night. Any questions, comments before we go? Amen. Who is that? That's my mother. I told you all she had a birthday. So happy birthday, mom. You said it was powerful? Yes. Could you give us one thing that you thought was powerful? Wait, I didn't hear that part. Say it again. I said I couldn't say I'm glad to say amen. Amen. Liberation. Truth is liberation. I have to stand here sometimes and just open my life up and say the things that sometimes I probably would like to, to keep hidden. But I recognize that there is liberty in being honest with yourself and with people because everybody knows that this walk is not flawless. Everybody knows that if a person speaking can say, I wanted to do this or that, then they can say, you know what? There's hope for me. And that's ultimately what I want to do every time I stand up is give everybody the hope that you can achieve what God has made available because it's not in our own strength. Thank you for sharing that. We greatly appreciate it. Anyone else? Well, it's been a pleasure. It's been a blessing. Uh, Mama, I hope you enjoyed your day and I hope you were just shower with the love and all of that oh, you deserve. Yeah, day. Amen. God bless. Well, people of God, I pray you sleep, be sweet. I'm just excited. I've been excited all the day long. God just gave some revelation that has blessed my life and he took over this message and did it how he wanted to do it. And for that, I'm grateful. So have a blessed night. I'm still going to play a song, but I know it's late for some of you. Be blessed, be encouraged, and spread the word. People of God, we have YouTube. These messages go up, and they are blessing people. Why not you subscribe and listen to the messages when, you're, when, you, when you need help, when you need you know, encouragement? Please do so, because this is the time where God is about to do something new in all of our lives. So just ask him, Lord, do something new in me. Something that cannot be denied. And he will grant you your request. God bless you all. Hallelujah.